Thanks so much, Nikesh, and welcome everyone. This is very exciting. Two years ago, if you had told me that we were going to have a user experience day, I wouldn't have known whether to believe you. And here we are uh, doing this for real. So let's dive right in. Um, our wonderful colleague, uh, Paul Adams, has lost his voice today. So I'm going to do some of his intro slides on his behalf on what is UX design. And then together we're going to talk about what that means for us at OpenMRS and where we're coming from. Um, so what is UX design? What do we mean? What is it not? And how can your whole team be involved? These are some of the things we're gonna cover today. But let's get the boring stuff over with first. So uh, International Standard Organization, ISO, uh, describes user experience as someone's perceptions and responses that are the result of how you use or anticipate using a product system or service. Let's make that a little simpler. It's a person's perceptions and responses and that person's use of a product system or service. Let's go deeper. So one of the key things we want everyone here to take away today is that user experience, AKA UX, goes way beyond UI design, AKA user interface. So user interface is an important part of a user's experience, but um, we often accidentally say the word UI or UX interchangeably, but they're actually two different distinct parts of the design world. So for UX designers, they're very concerned with the whole process, which includes everything from branding, executing the designs, how usable they are, and the function of what we're actually trying to achieve. Experienced UX designers will perform a lot more than you might expect. All kinds of different research activities to gather the different evidence that they need to make solid design decisions, and then test those solutions with users and stakeholders to build confidence before any investment happens in development. And we'll talk about how that becomes really relevant financially as well. It goes a little something like this. There's lots of diagrams out there, but this is a classic going from the discovery phase to defining what we think is going on and needed to developing that thing and then delivering it in the real world. Now, one of the things I think we've uh, really seen and learned from having our professional user experience designers involved over the last two years has been the amount of user-centered research that has been going on. This includes unveiling insights that we didn't know when we started doing the research. Now, where did we start from as OpenMRS? Why are we investing in user experience and what research and testing has already been going on? There are a couple reasons why we're investing in user experience. The first is very simple. It's hard to work together when the user experience and product flow and the user interface is not consistent across all of our different uh, global, global, global front ends. But another reason uh, is that it's actually more efficient to invest in user experience early. Uh, there's a little company you might have heard of called IBM. And years ago, they did research into what is actually the return on investment financially when we uh, make changes early on in the design process compared to realizing we missed something and having to change it later when the software is already built. And as a result of their research, they came up with this rule called the 110-100 rule of change. And what this basically says is that when you're working on software, it's like a giant iceberg where if you make, uh, if you make a change early because you, you do some user interviews, some user testing, and you realize, whoa, we missed a key thing here, uh, it's very, very cheap to make the, the change to the design early. Um, so initial research is the cheapest place to make the change in the design. If you realize it later and you need to go back and tweak the design, it's a bit more expensive. But when it's the most expensive is when we didn't realize at the research phase or the design phase that there was something we did not account for and we end up having to make the change in the software. And that is a very expensive way to do software development 
it's much faster to realize things during a research phase rather than when something is already built. But the final and perhaps most important reason that we're focused on user experience going forward um, as OpenMRS is because we want to know, are we actually focused on the right problems for our users? Let me give you a, a background example and then some real world examples for OpenMRS. Have you ever seen a beautiful glass bottle of tomato sauce? It looks so nice. It sits on the table, all shiny. Looks like a great user interface. However, over time, that top gets all sticky and kind of gross to touch. Uh, all of the stuff that you want is actually at the bottom. And then by the time you shake it out, it all kind of explodes out onto your food and you have way more sauce than you wanted. And you also don't get the control over the exact amounts that you want. And so a better example of something that has a nice user interface and user experience is this redesign of the sauce bottle. It's plastic, you can squeeze it to control exactly how much sauce you want to come out. Um, it's upside down, and so you don't have this same problem of all of the sauce kind of falling out of the bottle onto your plate at once. This is a, a kind of classic example of the difference between the interface versus the user experience, which is much better when you can control the sauce that's coming up. Okay, that's enough about sauce. Let's talk about uh, the electronic medical record. So often we get really focused on what we are working on. For example, patient registration. And we might step back to say, well, who is actually trying to do this? Um, this is a, a real example of someone using the registration page in the real world. Um, and we might go, oh, okay, um, she needs to look up different IDs. She's got lots of kind of um, cards and barcodes next to her. She's using this particular type of laptop. We need to make sure it's optimized for this kind of setting. Duh, duh, duh. But if we took another step back, we would realize the context of the user. Look at all of those people waiting. Look at the pressure on this user, waiting to get into the clinic, waiting to register with her. And so actually, perhaps the user's need is not so much registering a patient, but she wants to get people in the clinic fast. So we have to ask ourselves, does our design solve the user's main problem, which might turn out to be more about efficiency um, and speed rather than the details of registration? Again, situation dependent, but these are the kinds of pieces of information you look for when you're doing user experience research. Let's look at another example. Um, where this, this happened about a year ago, where through uh, Kiran, one of our designers who you'll hear from today, uncovered a bigger pain point that we didn't really think about when it came to writing the requirements. So um, we had this project where we said, hey, designer, we, we need patient lists. You know, people want to see their patients who are lost to follow up. We need a nice, easy way to show here's all the patients that are relevant. So we got that design. Great. However, because we set aside time for user interviews, user testing, what he noticed was he kept noticing that users needed to quickly switch from patient to patient to patient because often in the heat of the moment when you're in that uh, work environment, the queue outside your door is very long and every moment matters. And so without anyone asking for this specifically, uh, he realized that it would be really helpful if clinicians had a side list they could quickly use to go to the next patient that they want to look at. And so uh, this is still a patient list, but it's solving a more urgent, valuable problem day to day uh, and is a nice, a nice way of reusing the patient list stuff that uh, he'd already worked on. Uh, we were lucky enough to see a very large pediatric hospital using something very similar to this. And we saw the impact that this kind of design, having something to quickly switch from on the side had on the users in terms of efficiency of seeing patients. And it was amazing to see that flow through the center. 
So what have we been doing already around OpenMRS? You might have heard we've got a weekly design call uh, where we get together with um, designers, uh, uh, users and stakeholders and business analysts and project and product managers from all across our community. We also have a UX channel where the latest designs come up and we share questions and concerns. But why are we doing all of this? Is it just because we like calls? Well, maybe. But um, the main reason is to ask questions and gain context before we dive into doing mock-ups or architecting a solution um, so that we really understand the problem that we're trying to solve. So this, uh, this kind of terrifying diagram is just to show you that we've been developing this phased approach to we start with uh, interest in a feature or a need, we go through a design phase of discovery, ideating, designing, user testing, validating, iterating, before we start doing something like a developer handover. Um, and we've got all these different calls that are supporting us to do that. But uh, let me just emphasize now how much has been going on over the last year. Uh, this all really gets baked in the real world through things like site visits, workflow shadowing, user acceptance testing feedback, user interviews. And we've been so fortunate to have colleagues literally around the world doing in-person reviews with, uh, with real world users, as well as joining us for a lot of online live user testing, uh, where we watch how people click around. Our designers have used a lot of very interesting survey based techniques where we can see, okay, how did someone react to this design? Um, so it's certainly been an interesting year of both synchronous and asynchronous user testing. Through all of this, we've worked through quite a lot of user research questions from what should it look like to get around the EMR overall, the architecture patterns that you're going to see in just a couple moments are all coming out of early user research into the patterns and needs that, that we learned about through user interviews. Same thing is true for how should you care for one patient versus a group of patients? What do we notice when we uh, work with different folks around test results, medication ordering, getting a patient onto a particular list? Um, what, how does a community health worker want to work offline? These are some of the questions that um, you saw in the previous slide. We've been applying different methodologies to research and better understand. If you're interested in any of these, I'll share the link to this wiki page where we've been inventory uh, taking for all of these different pieces we've been researching over the last two years. As a result, we've some of you might have heard of Zeppelin. It's just an online tool that we've been using as a design handover tool and an inventory of design assets. So for example, um, it gives us an inventory of design components. Hey, what should this button look like? How should it look in OpenMRS 3? Um, what should the text look like? For example, here, when the title of an attachment is really long, kind of explains all of these um, piecemeal expectations from the design. Uh, but more importantly, it then takes that together into specific design artifacts that one can then use and build on. So with that cliffhanger, uh, I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful colleagues, Alini and Kiran, who are uh, professional user experience designers from Sonder Design. And they've been working really hard on improving our design documentation and making our patterns more clear. So I'm now going to hand it over to them to walk us through uh, our patterns today. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Hi, Grace. everybody. Yeah. That, that was an amazing introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I think I'm going to share my screen with you now, and then um, Kieran may start talking a bit about what motivated OpenMRS and us particularly to um, working on this project of improving our product documentation. 
Hi, everybody. Yeah, thanks again, guys, for the uh, wonderful introduction and the great um, context setting for this UX day. It is indeed great to see so many people on a UX call. Um, yeah, so in this presentation, we are going to share um, a little bit about a piece of work that we started a couple of months ago um, around documenting uh, OpenMRS 3.x. I'll start by explaining a little bit the objectives and the scope of what we're working on, and then I'll hand over to Alini to show us in more detail um, what we've been doing um, and share some more details on what's coming next. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat in case there's questions in, as we go along, but we'll definitely leave space for questions um, and feedback at the end. So let's jump in. Uh, so what is the documentation? Well, the documentation is a detailed description of the features, key elements, and interaction patterns that make up OpenMRS 3. And OpenMRS 3, as Grace introduced, is really about having consistent design language. So by spending time with users and iterating on uh, our ideas, we find a consistent way of representing pieces of information that users need and ultimately of answering or meeting some of the needs that we uncover. And when we see, um, when we create components and we start to have a, a degree of confidence in them, then we incorporate them into our design system. So many of the components that you see on screen now, you should be quite familiar with. We have a visit header, a patient header, a side rail, we have a vitals header down the bottom. These are things that have existed for quite some time now in, OpenMRS 3 and that we have a strong degree of confidence in them from all of the testing that we've done. Um, so yeah, this is our components um, and we want to start documenting these components to ensure that they're understandable for implementers, BAs, uh, developers, as well as designers, and then show how these components fit into features. So we've looked now at patient headers, visit headers, we want to describe, first of all, how these components work and then how they enable features like drug ordering, clinical views, offline mode. So for devs and BAs, we want to try to reduce the amount of hunting you have to do in, in Zeppelin to find the different states or um, configurations of specific components, depending on uh, where they're implemented. Um, for designers, previously you had to really be in kind of communication with me or with Paul to know like how do these things work, what are the rules for how to use them. So we want to create this documentation so that designers have a resource that they can go to to find out, okay, how do I build a, a kind of a standard patient chart um, in uh, OpenMRS 3? What, where can I go to find um, components to, to build those um, screens? And then even for implementers, when we've reached a stage where we have features described, we're hoping that this can explain how do these features work out of the box and what are the rules or what are the guidelines for extending or improving um, the, um, the features to meet maybe custom needs of that implementation. So we started 3.x all the way back in 2019 by adopting carbon design system. And this gave us a really solid foundation for generic components in our products. So radio buttons, data tables, tool tips, check boxes, input fields. We got these for free, super accessible out of the box. We got strong typographic rules, but now we're kind of at a stage where we want to ensure that the product specific components that I mentioned earlier, like patient headers, visit headers, vital headers are documented to the same standards and to the same degree um, of detail as these generic components that we got from Carbon. Um, so we want to ensure that the implementations are, um, impl are using these features and using these components in a way that is consistent with how we intended them in, in the design and that they're placed uh, in the locations that enable the features um, that will also be uh, documented. So at this point, I will hand over to my colleague Alini, who's going to uh, show in more detail what we've been doing um, and walk you through uh, the, the vision for what we're going to um, what we're building. Thank you, Kieran. Um, so um, 
I joined OpenMRS uh, earlier this year with the specific mission of um, helping the team, the design team, build a better product documentation to take care of some of the uh, difficulties that we're having as the community grows, as new implementers come up. Um, and I kind of treated this project um, as its own like design product that had a discovery phase when I was like mapping out um, what exactly was the need uh, of everyone involved. Uh, and now I'm at the stage of like prototyping this product and seeing how it um, fulfills the needs of my users, which are like you guys, basically. Um, so, um, the vision that we define together for what the new product documentation should be involves um, four main um, parts, pieces, uh, so to say. Uh, we want to explain um, how the OpenMRS tree system is structured, how like different apps connect to each other, um, what are they based upon, um, how you can like build modules and packages and extensions on top of the existing apps. Um, we want to reach a common ground on product vocabulary. Uh, we know that different teams uh, call all of our OpenMRS elements different things, and we need to come up with uh, a common language to um, make sure that collaboration is going well uh, between BAs and developers between developers and designers and everyone is like uh, referring to the same things consistently. Uh, we want to do a thorough documentation of all of the apps and features, like the big um, modules that we develop, you know, the, the clinic dashboard, the pharmacy module, the um, the feature for like ordering medications. We want to explain how each of these functionalities work uh, in order for implementers to understand whether it makes sense for their distribution, um, how they can customize it and improve upon our, our reference application. And finally, we want to do a detailed description of all of the UI patterns that we showed in the beginning, like the, the main components that make OpenMRS and they are custom made uh, for this product, like the patient header, the vitals header, the navigation, uh, things that we use the carbon design system heavily as a base, but now they are so like our own that we need to explain <laughs> how they work and how they were created. So this is the full-fledged product documentation. Um, it's like our longer term vision for uh, what it will be, uh, but we have to start small. We have to start with something. So the thing that we decided to start on was exactly the, the smaller components, the UI patterns, um, because we felt like this would be um, adding more value in the shorter term to developers who are working on features and customizing features for their own distributions. Uh, so that's what I'm going to show a little bit of. This is still a work in progress, um, but um, let's just dive into it because uh, we are very confident that this will be very helpful for developers across the world working with OpenMRS. So um, this is an example of a documentation page for one of our components, which is the vital tether. It appears prominently on the patient chart and it has uh, many like small elements. I'm going to jump from keynote to the browser to show you like a live version of it. Um, we, were, we have been working for I mean, a couple months, I think, um, in this project documentation, and we have a few components uh, that we consider like 
ready to go, but everything like is constantly evolving. So <laughs> uh, I don't think we'll ever consider any of this like done because the product documentation is a living thing. Um, but so let's let's take a look at the vitals header. You might notice that this uh, website is quite different from the OpenMRS wiki. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, but this is like the basic structure for the documentation of pattern. Uh, we give uh, a quick definition of what it is and where it appears. Um, every page and feature that the component appears on is linked and will go to the, the bigger like app or feature page. This patient charge page is just an empty page for, for now, but um, it will uh, come to life one day. Then we explain the component in detail. Uh, what are its elements? Uh, which of these elements come from the carbon design system? Which of them are custom made by us? Um, most of the time you'll see that the, the components of, of, a, of a pattern um, are just pieces of like text put together, but they need to be put together in a very specific way to uh, represent something, to give meaning to a piece of data um, and to be easily comprehensible by our users. So here we are thoroughly specifying um, every one of these pieces. Uh, we talk about here about like the timestamp that we use, like how it evolves from the moment that you log in uh, patient's vitals and what it looks like after a while. Um, we talk about the tiny elements inside this info mo module. What are these arrows for? How the highlight behaves? Uh, we're also like giving names to things that that uh, previously didn't have a name. So we're calling it a highlight. Uh, we're we're like um, defining the specific states for a component. Uh, for example, for the vitals, it can be a normal sign, it can be abnormal, or it can be uh, in danger mode um and yeah this is just i'm not gonna go like too deep into um explaining this particular component you can take a look at it afterwards um and this section this behavior section is like how the component behaves on a page along with other elements from the system. Um, so we specify how it resizes once you change the window size, um, how it looks when you open the workspace versus when it's closed, um, this little animations. Um, like I hope that it can put um, like, more clarity into the component uh, as opposed to just seeing like the small pieces of it. So these are like um, actual prototypes uh, and are very close to how the product looks, uh, the reference app looks right now. Um, yeah, so uh, this is it uh, for the, this is an example of, uh, of a component that's documented. Uh, in the end, we always link to like related pages, both in this documentation and in Carbon Design System. And right now, what we have is like this section here, the UI pattern library section. Um, and like we, we design like a way of knowing uh, which items are done. There's like little tag here that says that it's ready. The ones that are under review uh, have this like in progress tab. Um, so this is like a little sneak peek of the future <laughs> of OpenMRS product documentation. And as I said, it's a work in progress and uh we have a very long ways to go with this uh let's go back to keynote so um you might have seen that i was showing it to you on a different website from our current product documentation um this is zero height it is a tool that is specifically built for documenting design system and like product specs 
Um, and that's the one that we decided to use because it has a few advantages over our, our current tools. Um, this will be a dedicated hub just for product documentation to explain how OpenMRS3 works and what you can do with it. Um, it has a very restrictive page structure. So like I am not able to put a page inside of a page inside of a page and have like an infinite um, tree of pages that go very deep. So everything is very flat and things cannot hide <laughs> inside of that documentation, which I think it, it, it's a good thing. And it also plays very well with design tools, with Figma, with Sketch. And um, I can, for example, it can probably replace Zeppelin as a tool in the future. Not right now, because we have a ton of things in Zeppelin, but um, in the future, uh, it has the ability to receive, I can up upload uh, a design file and it picks up all of the components with its different states, the spacing um, specs and everything, everything that Zeppelin has, but like integrated along with the components documentation. Um, so it plays very well with uh, with design tools. It's a very simple tool to work with. It accepts like markdown for writing, and it also accepts code snippets, uh, which is something that we really, really hope to have in the future. Like uh, just like the Carbon Design System has um, an explanation of the component, uh, a design preview, and then a live coded component uh, that you can like interact with and copy and paste the code uh, to your distribution. Um, so um, taking from like a, a, a bit of uh, things that I've mentioned that Zero Hide is amazing for, um, we have uh, one more thing up our sleeve. Um, so this is the Sketch logo, which is the design software that our team is currently using for building uh, OpenMRS as a whole, the new features, the, the specs that go to Zeppelin. And um, during this documentation process, we uh, realized that it would be a great strategic move to migrate our design files from Sketch to Figma, which is another design tool that has a few advantages. Uh, this is gonna be like a long process, it's not gonna be done like overnight, but I am already working on it. Um, and why Figma? Like why this person comes up and just said, oh, we need, you need different tools for everything. Um, so working with Figma has a few key advantages that I think it's going to be very helpful for OpenMRS in the long run. Um, it is web-based and it's built for collaboration. So it's very natural for uh, two designers, three, like a whole team to be in the same file at the same time, like working together. Um, it has a very good like comments uh, and like reaction feature. Um, it is more democratic than Sketch because Sketch is exclu exclusive for um, Apple computers, for Macs. Uh, Figma is web-based, so anyone um, in any operation system can use it. So I think it's very much more aligned with the open source philosophy um, than, than Sketch with our current tools. Um, it is much easier to maintain, like the structure that Figma offers for building components um, is much better than Sketch in my opinion. Um, and it will be generally a much lower barrier for new designers to enter the OpenMRS community. So that's why we plan to do this big change. And the change is starting with the components, with those same components that are being documented in zero height. Um, so this is, this is it. Um, 
I I don't know. I I was planning to show you um, a preview of the Figma file with the our, our earliest components. I think I'm going to do that very quickly, um, just to show you like how how it works in real life. Um, I think we have some time. We have like a few minutes still. We're very close to done. Um, so let's do it. So this is a mess, okay? I'm going to show, I put like the things that are um, reasonably organized in a page uh, to show it to you. But uh, we have, we already have like all of our styles, our, our visual styles for UI, for text and for interactive elements here. And these are like a few examples of our components. So um, you might be familiar with this. This is the patient header, which we're now calling the patient navbar. Um, and like here in this, uh, in this uh, white panel, we can select like where it appears, like this is the implementer version, this is the patient that is in a visit version. Um, we can choose if it has like the hamburger menu, this is like for responsive pages. If it's a longer page, it doesn't have the menu, it has the navigation on the page. It's all explained in the navbar component. Um, and so like the, the way that Figma uh, allows us to build components is very closer to how they're coded, I think. Um, this is the patient header and you can toggle if you want the details to appear or not. You can say, um, um, I'm putting like a, a variant for the context in which the header appears. So if the patient is diseased, uh, it like it displays in this different way. Um, we have like interactive effects, like cover effects, focus effects. Uh, if it's pressed, like a button. Um, so this is like a very very um, <laughs> quick example of the the kind of stuff that we're building on on Figma. Uh, I'm not going to show you much more because the rest of the file is very messy still, uh, but this is something that uh, will be happening in the next chapters of our work with OpenMRS. So I'm going to throw it back to Kieran uh, so he can talk about the next steps, what's, what's coming up. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you're all as excited as we are about where we are. And I want to share a little bit about where we're going to go next. Um, so the first point is about tokenizing uh, the styles to make the UI files themselves more themable. So as you know, 3.x is built to be themable uh, by different uh, implementations. And as this new design system takes shape in Figma, visual design decisions are being tokenized. So this means holding things like color, corner radiuses, spacings in a token, which is later held in a JSON file. So imagine if we could get to a place where code is pointing to a JSON file, which is controlled by a, um, by a design tool. So now a developer gets a, a push notification that uh, a visual design change has made, uh, and then they can choose to commit or uh, reject these visual design changes. So this should make um, theming the reference application uh, design system even easier um, for other designers and implementations and later uh, for developers working on other uh, distributions of 3.x. As part of the documentation, we want to include accessibility and internationalization guidelines. Um, so how does reference application adapt to accommodate languages with different scripts like Khmer or Hindi? How does the UI adapt to facilitate right to left languages like Arabic? These are things that we will uh, later include in the documentation with obviously visual examples, um, as well as the accessibility documentation. Uh, we want to make sure that we're building an inclusive EMR, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it, it makes more sense 
um, for, um, for all of our users. So if we have documentation on how the patient chart is keyboard navigable, if we have documentation on the uh, contrast ratios that are required for different components, this ensures that different uh, branded versions of the EMR are meeting these um, AA accessibility standards. Um, we also want to sync design and development into one design system, as Alini mentioned, by bringing code components into our zero height documentation. What you saw earlier today was um, design components, and as you're probably familiar with in the carbon documentation, they have interactive coded components. So that's also what we will um, later build into the zero height documentation with code components uh, alongside the visual examples. Um, and lastly, we want to design a workflow for implementers working on OpenMRS uh, collaborating with the central design team. We want to create a feedback loop um, to learn from implementations, to learn from designers working on other um, distributions of OpenMRS, how the design system, how the components within it can be improved. How can we learn uh, the need, about the need for additional components sooner before um, RefApp um, kind of focuses on that uh, problem space. So this is a little bit of um, looking forwards, um, but that's pretty much what we have for today. Um, like I said, I hope you're as excited as we are about um, this big leap forwards in documenting um, 3.x. And yeah, we'd love to hear your first impressions. If you have any questions, uh, we'll do our best to answer. And yeah, thank you all and thanks, Alini. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you everyone for um, listening to our megalomaniac plan for like <laughs> having like better better design of Pretty Yeah, thank you, Alini and Kiran. That was awesome. It's really exciting to see this coming together. It's definitely been a labor of love for you for a long time now, uh, especially Kiran, who's been with us for <laughs> a while now and has seen us uh, really go through quite a journey. Um, some great questions asked in the chat. Uh, and for the sake of the recording, I'll just share what was shared there. So Gurpreet asked about, uh, will zero height evolve to support versioning? We've got this UX UI pattern now. What happens when evolutions happen? Um, Eleni, did you want to comment uh, further yeah. on that? Yeah, I, I actually answered on the chat. Uh, but so what we are documenting here is um, the reference app for OpenMRS, right? So uh, we know that there are many different versions of OpenMRS across the world. Uh, and everyone is doing something differently. Uh, we want to like register and document um, how we thought about it from the beginning uh, and how the component works like for now. Um, we know that it will be changed and customized. Uh, the idea for Zero Height is to evolve as O3 evolves. Uh, but we we want to have like a single source of truth for it. So if we need to, if we realize that everyone is putting something new in the patient header and we know that it makes sense to add it, we will add it to the component and we'll add it to the documentation. Uh, but the idea is that like this, this will be like the vanilla version for, for OpenMRS and uh, whatever comes next, we hope that implementers um, have a good sense of like why we made these design decisions. Um, and if when you're going to evolve your 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 distribution, uh, you'll do it like um, you do like educated design decisions on top of ours. I don't know if that's like clear. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eleni. Um, a, a question from me. Um, so it sounds like one of the uh, big benefits to the tool that that we're using uh, for documenting uh, uh, the, these 
patterns um, is that it connects directly to the tooling that you're using, like, uh, well, now Figma. And thanks for demoing that. I think uh, one of the things that our community has been watching and learning is just the extent of specialized skill sets that professional UX designers bring to the table. Um, and seeing you work with Figma is a good example of that. So uh, as, as we, um, if in the future there's pieces of the patterns that are iterated on, I guess that would automatically get updated in the documentation based on your work in Figma, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it re it still requires some work, you know. <laughs> um, the the actual, like, the, the components that you will be able to see, like, the specs of, like, sizing, colors, etc., um, they are automatically updated, but the documentation needs to be, the, the writing needs to be adjusted, the the animated previews would need to be adjusted. So um, it requires work, it requires maintenance, um, but we think it's like a, a lot easier to do than like doing everything, absolutely everything by hand, um, taking it to the wiki or, or, or managing it in Zeppelin, uh, which honestly doesn't have great navigation for that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, um, it, it will still require a lot of work if a component changes, uh, but we are setting things up so it's easier to do than like the current situation. Yeah. Awesome. And Alina, are you comfortable sharing a link to the work in progress pattern documentation? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so here it is, it's in the chat. Awesome. I believe it's also in the like Google Slides uh, version of this presentation that I linked over to you. Um, it's very raw. I mean, it's, there's a lot of empty pages still, but we're just trying to map out uh, what uh, what is necessary, like the pages that we do need to build and link to one another. Um, but the area that is like more robust right now is the UI pattern library. Um, and there are a few pages there that uh, everyone can explore. And I hope it's a nice reading. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, in fact, you, yeah, that, that's so great to, to be able to start sharing it around. Uh, it's looking just gorgeous. Uh, it's really fulfilling to see this coming together. So thank you so much, Alini. I'd like to open it up um, to everyone for questions. However, first, before we break for questions and then break for a break, uh, we're going to hear from our colleague Pius from Uganda, and he's going to share with us what it's been like for him as a developer uh, going through this experience of using the all of these design systems, etc. cetera. Um, so Pius, I'm gonna welcome you to share your experience. Thanks, Chris. Um, just allow me to share my screen briefly. Go for it. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, I think everyone can see me. Hi, um, Pius from Uganda. And um, I work with uh, MITS, the Uganda EMR team, as well as Ori. So um, I'll just um, go through a couple of things. I hope my screen is up now. Yeah, I think my screen is now up. So yeah, uh, so coming to coming into O3, I let me just start by saying I joined the community, uh, the Open Numbers community last year, and I kind of joined around the time when there was a switch from um, Open Numbers to Open X to Three Open X, and there was this um, kind of shift on how uh, on on you know front end technologies and how uh, UI can be made better and reusable. So one of the things that I really found really um, interesting coming to this was um, for starters, the design, uh, working with the design team. Uh, I've interacted with Paul and Kirian on several occasions and also both physical and virtually. So uh, uh, so working with the Zeppelin, I think uh, Paul kind of uh, gave some kind of, um, uh, Paul and um, Aline, yes, uh, kind of gave some introduction towards uh, use of Zeppelin and as well as Grace. 
So working with Zeppelin was is really helpful because um, once uh, you know us as developers sometimes uh, design spending time on design isn't really like the not everyone enjoys that kind of work because there's back and forth CSS isn't as easy as it looks. Uh, everyone sometimes um, puts pushes aside, but it takes more work than it looks like. So working with Zeppelin uh, in this case was uh, really convenient because uh, uh, it, once all the designs, once the designers have gone through the process of um, uh, interacting with their end users, getting feedback from the different stakeholders, uh, they come up with these designs and basically uh, as me as a developer, uh, me as a developer, all I need to do is basically just implement what has already been agreed on and what has been uh, what has gone through the uh, the, the user testing process. And um, but, uh, let me just briefly, like a few seconds, maybe talk about this. So uh, just give you an example of one of the UIs on Zeppelin. Uh, this is uh, I think uh, this is the Vitals. So of course, out of the box, it gives provisions for, for things like, for example, uh, the dimensions to use. The colors, of course, uh, as far as these colors are concerned, uh, these colors are already predefined on the OpenMS style guide. So it's really easy to basically just you know hit the ground running uh, when it comes to uh, implementing, when it comes to bringing the designs to life. Uh, that's first. So then the next thing I want to talk about is mostly around uh, the way the way um, uh, let's say open let's say three point X is basically designed. So, uh, and I'm going to use Ori uh, since I'm part of the Ori team. <laughs> I'll use Ori too for this slide demo. So, uh, going to 3.x, um, there has been this. Um, what what has been done is mostly uh, most of these components and most of this component development has been going uh, has been uh, focusing on configuration first, configuration first, and then you know uh, to make it easy to like implement us to you know make some customizations like. To the UI, to some things that maybe that maybe previously would take more time or need more work on it. So I'll just show you something quick. Uh, so one of the interesting tools that are currently available is what I call the implementer tools. In this case, so I'm just going to that two things. Or if you notice, I I know the number of people on this call, and if you notice, uh, there are a couple of differences with what you're seeing on the screen and what actually OpenMS gives out of the box. Of course, the OpenMS logo is, yeah, is different. It's not here, and the colors are a little bit different from the usual green. So, uh, just to uh, just to show you how easy it is, or more of like what we went through when when uh, trying when moving uh, when move, when uh, trying to migrate uh, Uganda EMR to three point X. Uh, so the number of ESMs already, of course, but uh, that's a story for another day. So, uh, so uh, let's just say we want to make a slight change, such as the color. Uh, it's as easy as you know. Um, and I just want to go to the color palette here and just pick a random color from material, and they just come right here. So, uh, changing color codes or changing the way the UI uh, looks like is as simple as going to the meta tools, uh, searching a configuration. For this case, we're looking at the style guide, editing. Uh, let's say, of course, there are, there are three main colors currently uh, are affecting different things. Uh, different. Of course, we're looking at the main colors. We we'll look at things like the accent, the button colors, and the rest. So changing that is as simple as getting your color code and pasting it right there, and boom, you have your dark color right there. Uh, so that is something that didn't even take what two seconds. Uh, yeah. So and then of course, as far as the logos are concerned, there is also this. Uh, there is also this where you can actually just uh, specify, like let's say, the path to an image, or in case you have an image locally on your uh, uh, locally on your uh, on your uh, on the project, for example, you can easily just change that by configuration, and you can hit the ground running basically. So um, I think that is it in summary. So I, all I can say is it has been awesome and it's kind of nice to you know to skip the whole bureaucracy and go straight to design and coding. Yeah. Back to you, Grace. Thanks so much, Pius. That is so awesome. It was it's especially exciting to hear about uh, how helpful the configuration has been. Uh, it's definitely been part of the dream is to make life easier. Um, it's also really exciting to hear about how these design assets made your life easier as a developer. Uh, I think for um, uh, 
uh, I'm guilty of this as a product manager. It, sometimes we assume that how to uh, the, the specific expectations of our engineering colleagues are clear in the designs when they might not be. And uh, Zeppelin has been helpful for that. Great to hear that validated. Well, um, I'm going to hand it over to Nikesh to lead us into Q&A for all of the panelists you've just heard from and then into break. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Pius, for the for, for, for wonderful uh, presentation and overview. So uh, being very new to the community, I'll say I keep mentioning this to Jennifer. Uh, I think uh, this overview and this presentation has been like uh, very, very helpful. And I'm personally so amazed to see uh, lots of things ongoing uh, in terms of uh, design and 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 the history that uh, that the open MRS has in terms of uh, design and very much excited uh, as 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 Kiran uh, said that slides of the uh, next step so it, it looks uh, truly amazing and I'm I'm very much looking forward to it uh, so yeah moving forward I think uh, we, since we have uh, like around uh, 10 minutes time uh, and uh, and all the participant has like already heard uh, where, where do we stand, where do we stand, and like why the open analysis has been like focusing and investing on uh, design thing. And uh, definitely uh, as the, through the presentation of Kiran and Elena, I think uh, we, we get a tentative understanding of uh, how uh, the wonderful, uh, the future really looks like. Uh, so like, if you have like any questions, uh, please feel, feel free to like open your mic and uh, like uh, suit out your uh, question to the panelists. Uh, and the and the presenter. So yeah, over to you, everyone. Uh, and like, if you didn't feel comfortable uh, opening and asking, you can also use the chat box uh, to uh, to ask the questions. Uh, yeah. If it's still silent in a few seconds, what I might suggest is that we let folks uh, have a quick break um, and then we can do a question check when folks come back. But uh, don't leave because uh, we've got some really exciting presentations coming up uh, after the break and Q&A. We will start by hearing from one of our own community members, Saruchi, and how she went through this whole journey herself be of becoming a UXer in her work in the OCL squad and all that that meant for her from learning about user research. So come back after the break. Over to you, Nikesh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Grace. Uh, so yeah, uh, looks like uh, there is there is no immediate <laughs> reaction or question. I think we we could tentatively discuss some of the initial reaction through the through the chats and through uh, some initial discussion too. So as you mentioned, uh, let's let's uh, go for the uh, ten minutes uh, break. Uh, so please please feel free to like uh, get yourself a coffee. It's it's, it's if it's the morning or, or get get yourself a glass of water. Um, go to the washroom and. Uh, we'll be be right back after uh, after ten minutes. Uh, so see you, see you, see you everyone around. 